So I will try to keep you awake, and uh, to do so, I will do two things. The first one that I will speak English with my very strong French accent, so hopefully it will keep you awake. As one of my friends uh, keeps saying to me, I mean, you speak without a slightest English accent, so that's pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, and then the other thing is that uh, I'm going to, continue to present you a couple of slides, because they are probably more uh, interesting to look at than me. So, and I hope this will keep you going. Well, um, you've already heard about SIET, so I'm not going to, uh, to be long on that one. Just you need to uh, explain that SIET is the authoritative voice representing the private economic services industry at the global level. And we are totally representative of the industry. On the one side at large, because we today represent about 50 countries around the world. But we have also, uh, as uh, members, the largest uh, staffing companies worldwide. So we are fully representative and recognized as such by uh, our key stakeholders. Well, these are the countries where we have operations. As mentioned earlier, we you know, operate in association with uh, national uh, federations, associations, trade organizations of uh, equipment companies. And we are pushing for more uh, associations to be established. We have to keep in mind that in many parts of the world we are still a very young and developing industry and still the industry has to be organized and to be better represented in many parts of the world. So that's our members from the national federation point of view and then we have, as I mentioned, a couple of members which are indeed the largest uh, staffing companies worldwide. What do we try to achieve? We have four key points there. The first one is, of course, we are there to promote, to, to, to defend, I would say, even, and to protect and to promote the interests of private development services. Uh, and to do so, we are also there to try to create the most suitable uh, regulatory environment for our members to operate. As you know, regulation in many parts of the world is a key driver of the development of the industry. And in many countries, we are facing you know, too many restrictions, conditions on the, uh, the delivery of services. In order to gain also recognition for the industry, we are there to increase quality standards. Uh, we have carbon ethics, and, and we are really there to try to, to raise the bar in terms of quality uh, delivery. And finally, and this is still a big issue for us with regard to the image of the industry, uh, there are still too many people, especially policy makers, you know, talking about our industry or adopting regulation on our industry without exactly knowing what we do, what we are, what we represent. And this is a big issue for us, so educating you know, people, policy makers, about the reality of the industry is one of our key uh, uh, missions. What are our guiding principles? Uh, well, four key ones. The first one is that work is an essential part of people's life and identity. I mean, if we are all here today, this is because of our jobs, our work. Uh, this is you know, one of the best ways to get you know, integrated and included in a society, so work is essential. The second one is that we are living today in very dynamic labor markets. Jobs are being created every day, but jobs are also being destroyed every day. Uh, so there is a need for you know, intermediaries helping to facilitate the matching between the supply and the labor market. And this one will become uh, even more important in the future. We'll get back to that uh, point later on today. <coughs> Freedom of choice in the labor market for us is essential too. We need to be able to offer a diversity of contractual arrangement, labor contractual arrangement in the labor market in order to meet companies' expectations and demands, but also more and more to meet people's expectations with regard to work. That's also a key trend to the labor market. And finally, we, we do consider that you know, appropriately regulated you know, staffing industry or equipment industry, whatever the name we, we call our industry, is essential and we are an embodiment of decent work of quality jobs. So this is the framework under which we operate. Now I'd like to move to, to, to the topic of the day. And as you know, I've been asked to uh, talk about two things. The first one is this changing world of work we are all facing. And the other one is <coughs> looking at this changing world of work, what is or what could be the role of our industry in facilitating this uh, revolution because this is actually a new revolution taking place in the labor market. Uh, and just to remind you, I mean, probably you are aware of that, but today we are facing the third industrial revolution, 
you are aware of the first two, you know, the, the re industrial revolution of the uh, uh, 18th, 19th century, then you had, you know, uh, between 1930 and 1970s, the second one, you know, with radio, TV, electricity, uh, as new technological innovations, and of course this had an impact on the way work was being organized, uh, and also in the way of the workers uh, were uh, employed, and this is mostly in the period of time of the wage earners, and with our economy becoming more and more services oriented. And now we are facing a third revolution, uh, industrial revolution, and this is of course related to ICT, computers, IT networks, even more. And then the new work patterns are really about you know, outsourcing, uh, individualization of the employment relationship, uh, with a distributed workforce, a dispersed workforce. And of course, that means that we have also to invent some new you know, security models or patterns, uh, new safety nets uh, for, for the people. And actually, and of course, this has impact on the way the labor market and work is being organized. And I try to, to put on a slide, you know, the, the key trends behind this new or this changing world of work. And if you look um, uh, in you know, the general life, I would say that's more the horizontal uh, part of the graphs. You know, on the society side, it's clear that we are now living in a flattened world. Uh, there is acceleration, everything is getting, you know, uh, faster, more complex also. There is kind of a work-life blend today. There is what I call despatialization also of work or virtualization of work. On the other hand, from the uh, individual side, there is this concept what I call conciliation. More and more people are willing to have everything and more immediately, right now, right, really like right now. And this is also about work-life balance, you know, combining flexibility but also having some security, combining individualism but also still having some kind of collectivism, uh, so I say kind of concilia conciliation of, uh, of contraries. And then if you look more at the uh, business side, uh, on the company side of course today you know, every company has to be flexible, agile, uh, companies have to adapt to this very complex, very uh, competitive uh, environment, economic environment, that means we need some more flexible production models, companies are now, as I mentioned, offshoring, outsourcing, uh, their workforce. That's on the company side. On the worker side, again, this is more and more about individualization. More and more people are willing to have, you know, one side fits one approach when it comes to employment relationship, when it comes to working conditions, and more and more workers are willing to have flexible hours so they can better accommodate, you know, private life and, and, and work life. So these are, in a nutshell, the main trends behind the, uh, the new reality of work. And as a result, uh, this new reality of work, you know, means that in, in today's uh, environment, uh, there is no one, there is no more one model of work. And it's really, the keyword is really a customer fit workplace. And, and, and the keywords to describe that is about destandardization of the employment relationship. So you now have a diversity of labor contracts. Uh, uh, in most countries, the country I am from, uh, France, we have about 40 different types of labor contracts. This is the same in Italy, this is the same in Belgium. Uh, you, you have all types of, of labor contracts, so the, the full time, the permanent employment relationship is no longer a norm actually. Individualization, I already mentioned it. Uh, virtualization of work because of the new technologies, you know. Work is no longer a place to go, it's more a thing you do, and you can do it you know, anywhere you are around the world as long as you have a, a Wi Fi connection. New work patterns, as I mentioned, and more and more, it seems we are moving towards you know, on demand work, and we get back also to that one later on. Companies are more and more organized, not only a vertical uh, dimension uh, and silo, but more and more it's horizontal, you know, companies, partnership, uh, networking with uh, partners. Uh, suppliers and uh, whatsoever. Just to give you an example, I read an article very interesting on Boeing. Boeing has 28,000 suppliers all around the world. 28,000 suppliers. To build uh, today the, uh, the latest uh, airplane they built 
is only uh, is actually outsourced to 70% to uh, suppliers, Boeing actually only built you know, 30% of, of the planes, they, they said. that's the new reality of work also. And that means that more and more you know, networks and communities are playing a great role in the world of work. As I mentioned, you know, companies are less about the place, and more and more workers are less you know, interested in you know, going to work for a company, but it's more you know, exchanging with their peers, working from some other companies on what they do and what they deliver, uh, rather than you know, just meeting their colleagues within the office. So the, the, I would say the rules of the companies are today uh, less and less uh, valid. And my last point is about intermediation and the back of that one, and of course this is very much of interest to our industry. Just want to provide you with a couple of facts and figures about what I just mentioned. And the first one is about destandardization of the employment relationship and of the working conditions of, of, of people. And I just put a couple of figures there. Once again, in France, my country, today two out of three workers have 80 people working time, meaning they don't work from Monday to Friday, from nine to five. So they can work night shift, they can work over the weekend, they can work you know, flexible working hours. But actually, the majority of workers in France do not have any longer uh, typical working time. In Europe, 15% of the workers today are self-employed, and this is about 33 million people. And believe me, in the future, this number will increase. I think we have reached today the climax of the you know, wage earner uh, society or model. In future, we will see more and more free agents, you know, consultants, whatever the name we, we call these people in this new a form of work, uh, but it will be less and less wage uh, earners and, and salaried people and more and more your self-employed uh, people. In the Netherlands, already 46% of the working population is working part-time, mostly as a choice, <coughs> so it's really voluntary, and of course there are more women doing part-time <coughs> than, than men, uh, but once again, I mean, the, uh, the norm is no longer working you know, full-time with a permanent contract. And finally, new forms of work are appearing. You know, and there are many of them, just on that one, you mentioned you know, teleworking. And you can see on that one that uh, Europe lags, lags behind you know, uh, Japan or the US. In Japan, 29% of workers are already doing telework. It doesn't mean that they work you know, from Monday to Friday from their home, but at least they spend one day a week working from home and not going to the office. 28% in the US and only in the convention, 18% in the US. <coughs> Another, I think, uh, characteristic of this new reality of work is uh, no longer the, the concept of having a balance between your work and your life. This is actually a blend between your work and your life taking place. And that's very interesting because in the you know, 1980s, actually work started to intrude into your private life because it was the development of you know, uh, ICT technologies. We started with faxes at home, and then we had you know, computers, laptops, and so on. And also because of the uh, you know, workload, uh, heavy workload, so we, a new, you know, more stressful uh, management model. So most of the people tend to bring work you know, at home. Uh, this is also where you know, teleworks are. But now we face, and this is the true, but now we face kind of a reverse uh, trend, which is that more and more your personal life is, invite, is being invited as well as invade uh, your professional life. And of course, this is about social media. Now you can use you know, Facebook or LinkedIn you know, being at the office. And when you post a story on Facebook, you know, is that related to work or is that related to your private life? There is a kind of a, of a mix. Uh, there is this uh, BYOD trend also, bring your own device, and this is especially true for young generations. And um, within my own team, I have young people, and they don't use the computer you know, that is being provided by the company, they use their own computer because they think they are better, they have you know, more uh, uh, up to the standards. Uh, and of course, that means you know, that creates some insecurity from an IT point of view, but that's a reality. Uh, more and more, you know, in, in these services oriented economy, you know, emotions, feelings, creativity uh, play a key role in, in, in work, and that means indeed that it is much more related to your own personality. So we now face a trend where this is more your know, individuals, emotions, personality inviting the work, uh, the world of work. 
Well, I mentioned that uh, earlier. Uh, work used to be a place, uh, a place to go. This is now a task to do. Uh, my office is where I am, thanks to all these you know, electronic devices we have. And of course, it's now almost impossible to switch off these devices during weekends and, and you know, uh, holidays. So we are connected you know, almost on a daily basis, uh, 24 hours a day, uh, and seven days a, a week, and probably 365 days a year. Uh, we remain connected to our work. And of course, this is raising the question of uh, the impact for business. And I think in the future we will see again two very different trends in, in, in the way companies will be organized. On the one hand, I think companies, large companies, will become even larger, even more global, and to some extent they will probably substitute to the welfare states. And we know the welfare states are almost gone because of lack of uh, funding. And probably uh, these companies will replace this. Uh, welfare states to offer protection, social protection to their own workers as a way actually to retain uh, their workers. Uh, and this is in a way a little bit you know, back to, to the past where in, in, in the 19th century you know, we have this what we call paternalism, uh, capitalism, where indeed companies were providing a lot of you know, social security but also housing to their workers. Maybe I mean, the, uh, we are going back to, to history there. But that's one trend. On the other one, and that's really an opposite trend, uh, I think we will see the emergence of you know, small size organizations to exist only to conduct projects. A little bit like you know, the, uh, the, um, the show business industry is being managed today, or even in some cases the construction industry. I mean, you will have a project to conduct, you will assemble you know, people, talents, suppliers all together for the length of the project. But once the project will be completed, then you know, all these companies, all these people will uh, move back to some other project. So this is really uh, a new way to uh, conceive your companies. And this is already already taking place, because in the US, uh, in the early 1970s, one in five Americans uh, were employed in a Fortune 500 company. Today, this figure is only one out of ten. So you can see that more and more people are working for smaller size companies and less and less for these big you know, global organizations. And all these trends for me have uh, um, uh, well, raised actually the question is whether we are moving towards a uh, casualization of work. And the question is whether you know, the employment relationship will tend to shorten. And I think today we are faced with you know, different types of employment relationship. You have still the old one, you know, the job for life one, and of course the people who are benefiting from this type of employment relationship is reducing, but still we have some, we have civil servants. Of course, but you have also you know, all the independent workers, like the doctors and lawyers, you know, they need to have a job for life. Mostly based on an open-ended contract, the length is, is at least, if not for life, but at least for decades, your employment relationship you know, supposed to last for decades, and the place of relation is really within a company, you know, you're not supposed to move from one company to another one. Then you have the, the next one, which is more related to employability, where you have indeed the diversity of labor contracts, where you can move from one contract to another one, what is important is for you to remain on private, so to upskill uh, on a very regular basis, and then I would say the employment relationship is more about years, and this is indeed inter-enterprises, meaning you are supposed to switch from one company to another one, if you want your career to advance. Then you have this uh, third type of employment relationship which is more about freelancing, and there the employment relationship is no longer a wage uh, employment relationship, it's more being self-employed, so you are your own boss. <coughs> and then the length is more about months or even days, and this is based, as I mentioned earlier, about projects. Uh, there is a project to be, uh, to be uh, implemented, you will work on this project, you will be employed during the length of this project, but then when the project is completed, your uh, employment relationship will also stop. And this is probably where we are today. But then we see a new trend which is really about on-demand expertise, where this is even no longer about being self-employed, this is really about contract for services, meaning that people will be paid only for the task they will have to deliver. And the task can be as short as for a couple of minutes, a couple of hours. And we already see that, especially I don't know if you're aware with all this, you know, uh, real-time marketplaces like you know, Google.com or um, 
is elance.com uh, or uh, what the famous one is the, uh, the Amazon one, uh, Nikkei 32, where indeed you know companies or you know, organizations have a task to do, and then they post this task on, on this website, and they say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to pay you know 50, 50 pounds, 100 pounds for this task to be accomplished. Who is interested? And then the first one, you know, to uh, to, to get a job. Uh, will be paid. So meaning you really don't have a problem relationship, it is just really delivering you know, a, a task for, for an amount of money and this is really moving toward you know, on-demand work. I'm not saying this is good, just saying this is what is going to happen in the future. Okay, in a nutshell I'm trying to do this part, but I have many more slides if you're interested, so I can, I can talk for hours about this one, but that's for me, you know, the, uh, the background of this changing world and once again, we are really facing a revolution there, and I think we do not fully realize that. <coughs> but we will see, you know, in a couple of years, looking backwards, that indeed we are really at crossroads. What does that mean? You know, how are we going to align the workplace to this new workforce? And of course, there, as an industry, we have a key role to play. And I'll try to, to summarize with a couple of key words in the world. Of course, we are here to be, you know, to do carry management. We are carry agents. We will have to help and to accompany these workers in this much more complex and disruptive you know, uh, world of work. So it's about transitions, helping people to move from one job to another one. What is important today is less the job you have, but then where this job will take you, you know, within the next couple of months or, or, or years. Tailored work, more and more as I mentioned, work will have to be individualized. Uh, this is the, uh, the custom fit workplace. So as an industry, we, we could help to, to organize this. We are also there to facilitate work mobility, uh, international, I would say, work mobility. Work-life balance, helping people indeed to, to, uh, to reach a better balance there. Providing also new safety nets to people, because of course, if you are no longer employed with a permanent contract, that means you have access to less you know, social benefits, less security. So we will have to build some new ways to uh, organize and to provide safety nets to people. Talent development. So not, not, not making war, but really uh, talent. Uh, I don't like this concept of uh, you know, the, uh, the war for talent. I think we as an industry, but also as companies, will have to develop and to create more talent. And also transparency, because of the complexity of the labor market, it would be more and more difficult to match the supply and demand of work. So we as an industry, we have access you know, to, to a large pool of workers, but also companies. So we are there also to better understand how the labor markets are. So I think from an industry point of view, we have very you know, interesting potential in the future. And this is reflecting this slide, which is not only about our industry, but business services uh, in uh, several European countries, as well as the US. And you can see that the trend is uh, increasing, meaning more and more, uh, uh, yeah. you know, the share of the, uh, of the, the, the industry being represented is increasing. Uh, and that's also because companies also are focusing more and more on their core businesses and they want to use and they both source and they want to use more external suppliers and of course we are part of this uh, business services sector. And probably the future might look a little bit like you know the past actually like in the middle age you know, if you remember we had this guild you know this art and craft you know trade organization and maybe this is the way our industry will evolve in the future not only doing the matching between the supply and demand of work but also representing the workers, and in that sense we will probably move towards, in a way, a role of a trade union, also being there to represent the workers, but also to defend them, to protect them, to fight for better working conditions for them, because this is also our interest. And of course to provide and to invent some new security nets for these people. What is clear is that as an industry, we today play a key role in the labor market, and our contribution, and I'll try again to, to summarize it, of points, we play this key role. It is not always totally recognized, but we play this, this key role in the labor markets. And reducing the timeline between economic recovery and job creation, we enrich also the job creation. We create jobs that do not exist otherwise. We are, uh, and as a consequence, we are uh, reducing you know, unemployment, whether structural or frictional. We are also minimizing the effect of the labor market segmentation because we offer stepping stone function, for instance, for young people who are helping young people to enter the labor market and then to find their way to the labor market. As I mentioned, we also 
improve transparency of the labor markets you know, by providing you know, intelligence and evidence-based policy. We help policymakers also to take decisions based on facts and figures. And also, I think if you want to, today to find solutions to the labor markets, we also have to cooperate with the other public services, whether the public or public services, but also it can be social NGOs or uh, education <coughs> services, training services. I mean, the unemployment problem will not be solved only by ourselves or only by the public and public services. I think it's time for all the public services to come together to try to solve the unemployment issue. This is our contribution to the labor market. The problem is, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the image of the industry is not as good as it should be, and we are still not seen as providing all this positive role in the labor market. And this is why last year, CIET, we, we launched a, a new vision for the industry, which is called Way to Work, a job for every person, a person for every job. And we try to summarize in one sentence, you know, really the contribution of our industry to a better functioning labor market, to a more inclusive society. And we launched this during the uh, annual conference that took place actually in London. It was organized by a UK member, the IEC, and, and it was really adopted by all of our members from all around the world. And what do we mean by the Way to Work? Well, a couple of things. The first one is that, of course, we are showing where the jobs are. So we are directing people to work. And this is, of course, a necessary point of contribution. Mm -hmm. But we are also offering a new way to work, providing you know, more freedom of choice in the labor market. We are, of course, giving people a great way to work. I mean, we are delivering decent and quality jobs. We should not be ashamed about that. And we are, of course, also helping people to organize the way to work, facilitating a better match between the supply and the demand of work in a faster way, in a better way. So this is what we mean by the way to work. And of course, it, it can be seen just as a pure marketing exercise, but much more than that, because our members also agreed to deliver based on this new vision for the industry. And this is the global pledges. All of our members from all around the world agreed to cover themselves within the next five years. And I'm not going to read the figures, but I have the figures there. Uh, and this is, I mean, this campaign is has been really, really useful and powerful to us to help to improve the image of the industry, to unite the industry around the one buyer, under one buyer, and to go outside, you know, and, and tell you the good news. And since last year, we, we have embarked into a global journey. We visited many countries. You know, for instance, I was in India last week to present this uh, way to work strategy. Uh, but we've been to Japan. We've been to uh, yeah, all around the world. Uh, to promote this new vision and this new approach for the industry. So I hope we will be also able to use it and, and in order to better explain, educate the policymakers about what we do and what we contribute to the market. Just to conclude, uh, so there is a changing world of work. There is a key role for us to play as an industry. However, we still have, I would say, some image problem or lack of recognition of the full role we play in the labor market, and this is something we all have to work all together. Uh, and there again, as a concluding point, I would like to, to mention a few ideas that we should do to better represent our industry, to be more active in promoting you know, contribution to growth and jobs, and also to better promote business services in general in our economy. And I think well, out of this point there is one which is really essential, it is to better explain to policymakers what is this new reality. Explaining them that the, the patterns of work are changing uh, and new forms of work are appearing, you know, business process of sourcing, code sourcing, co working, uh, and we need to position our industry into this uh, new world of work debate. Of course, we are providing flexibility in the labor market, but we do much more than that. We are actually also facilitating adaptation to change, and this is also we should set and, and, and promote our industry and to position ourselves not only as you know, pure flexibility providers but also as really caring agents you know the, and really developing ourselves as like gates and really being there to support you know, uh, the past of the people in the labor market providing a way to work. Thank you very much. We need to move on. Yes. Yes.